Greetings, everyone. Uh, can we could do a quick sound check? Can you just indicate in the chat if the sound is coming too clearly on your end? Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanusha Singh. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to open today's session and welcome you all on behalf of the National Health Laboratory Services and the National Institute for Occupational Health, which is a division of the NHLS. I would also like to welcome our guest speakers today, Mr. Martin van der Merkel from Pro Technique and Ms. Momina Umarji from the South African Health, Product, uh, Health Products Regulatory Authority and uh, also welcome to the Vital Consortium uh, team. Um, it's really wonderful to see this collaboration between the various institutions and to have the experts willing to come at short notice and share their knowledge with all of us. So on behalf of the NRH, we really appreciate it and we thank you. Um, today, we have um, over uh, 13,000 new cases reported and just over 3,700 deaths. So we certainly are in the eye of the storm, as the Minister of Health puts it. So we all, and also we learned this week that the WHO now acknowledges that the virus may be airborne in certain settings other than where aerosol generating procedures are performed. For example, in overcrowded environments with poor ventilation. So given this uh, new information, we need to rethink our control strategies and uh, see if we have indeed everything in place or is there a little more that can still be done uh, in terms of reducing risk. And I think each and every one of us have the power to contain the virus if we all religiously perform and continuously advocate for the precautionary measures, particularly to contain uh, exposure at the source. So uh, it is apt that today's session is on risk assessment so we refresh or review uh, our risk assessments if we have done them, or with the new knowledge, we, we now conduct the risk assessment in our workplaces where we haven't done so yet. Um, earlier in the week, we also had a session on vulnerable employees risk assessment. So I would like to urge those of you who have missed that session to visit the website and, and listen to the presentations as it does provide a basis for uh, today's session. We also had received several requests to do a session on um, res uh, respirator uh, protective uh, devices and PPE in general. And so today we will be talking about the testing of these respirators as well as licensing, uh, which the uh, SAFRA will cover for, for us. So I'm looking forward to those presentations. Uh, as you know, uh, all our sessions are recorded and they will be available on the website, which is zero rated. But more importantly, to make information even more accessible, we are extremely grateful uh, to have received generous funding from the Health and Welfare CETA through a partnership with Vital Consortium. Um, and uh, if Mr. Sergi Pillay is on the call, he will say a few words on behalf of, that, uh, of, of the initiative. So I'd like to once again thank you uh, for joining today's session and also thank the uh, NRH team and the Vital Consortium team involved in organizing the session um, as well as the guest speakers for making the time to join us today. I wish you all well and do stay safe. I would hand over now to our program director, Mr. Ashraf Raikliff. He'll take you through the proceedings for today as well as some um, virtual housekeeping rules. Thank you all. Thank you, Tanusha. Um, that was Dr. Tanusha Singh, the head of our NIH, National Institute for Occupational Health, COVID-19 outbreak response team, as well as the um, head of the immunology and microbiology section here at the NIH. So welcome again to, um, I think we're close to 40 now for the uh, online Zoom COVID-19 training sessions. Um, it is, I think, number 11 for the Wits Health Consortium here, Friday the 10th of July. Um, and the topic we're dealing with, with is workplace health risk assessment, as uh, uh, Dr. Singh has indicated a moment ago. And um, could I just uh, check with you, if you're all clear, that at the bottom of your screen, just a quick indication, and if I look on this screen over here, that's the one there. 
please only type your questions in the Q&A box. No other comments, no other non-administrative questions, just questions related to the presenter's content. And next to it, you'll see the uh, chat box over there where you can make either general administrative questions and so on. For specific uh, questions related to, to um, administration, um, administered by the Witsouth Consortium, it's important for you to email that is um, HWS training, HWS training at witshealth.co.za. So I'm Ashraf Raycliffe, the National Training Manager, and I just want to check um, if uh, Mr. Segi Pillay is on, no, not yet. So um, just to mention that we are in partnership with uh, the Witshealth Consortium in um, implementing a series of uh, COVID-19 training webinars. Uh, and this partnership is supported with financial resources by the Health and Welfare Center. And so on behalf of the National Institute for Occupational Health, um, as you know and understand that we're part of the National Health Laboratory Services, a sister institute to the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, the NICD. So as the NIH, um, we are very happy to be part of this partnership with the Witz Health Consortium and with the support of the Health and Welfare CETA. And Health and Welfare CETA has made certain resources available for those attendees, for those participants who are within the health and welfare and social development sector. And the registration process would have been the basis upon which you would then access those additional support from the Wits Health Consortium. And their email address is um, HWS training at witshealth.co.za. Okay, so um, I'm going to now just check if um, the next presenter is online, um, and that's uh, uh, Gabriel Mizan. Um, Gabby, are you there? I am, I am here, Ashraf. Okay, I'll ask you in a moment to join us uh, formally and to share your presentation. I just want to introduce the program. Thanks, Gabby. So the program for today, the Workplace Health Risk Assessment, is dealing with, the, firstly, the principles for health risk assessment, and that my colleague in the occupational hygiene section, that's Gabriel Mizan, will deal with the principles of health risk assessment. The next presentation will be dealt with by our colleague in the immunology and microbiology section, that is Dikaledi Matuka, and Dikaledi will deal with a bio-risk assessment tool for COVID-19. That's followed by our guest presenter, uh, Mr. Martin van der Meerwe uh, uh, from ProTechnic, um, and uh, he'll be dealing with testing of respiratory protective equipment, RPE, respiratory protective equipment effectiveness and we'll soon be getting the information and input from Martin. Uh, the second last presenter is uh, Momina Omaji uh, from SAPRA, and the topic that uh, Ms. Omaji will deal with is the role of SAPRA and the licensing process for medical devices, right? And some of those medical devices would be a part of the personal protective equipment, the PPE required. And then finally, the head of the, um, that is the oh, occupational hygiene section, almost got the section wrong, is the topic of importance of respirator fit testing by Jeanette Mangani. And that's the series of presenters. And we need to, speak, to stick to our time limits because it is quite a, a filled program. I'm going to hand over immediately to deal with the topic of principles of health risk assessment uh, to Gabriel Mizan. Gabby, are you online? Can you share your, your presentation? Thank you, Ashraf. And Thank you, let me, let me see if I can do that. Share screen. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, if you could just put it into, oh, there we go. Thank you, Gabby. Right. So uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Good morning, everyone. It's a bit strange to speak to an, an invisible audience, but I trust you all there. I can see the numbers. 
Um, so, so this this first presentation um, for this morning is about the principles of health risk assessment and particularly hazardous biological agents, uh, HBA risk assessment. And really, what I'm hoping to do is set the scene for the presentations that are uh, going to come uh, after me. So. Um, I would like to start with a little exercise. Um, so here is a list of some major causes of death in South Africa. And what I would like you to do, and please do it in the chat box, uh, not in the question and answers box. If you can write down the five main causes of death from this list, uh, that you think they are more important, uh, more important than others. So the first one would be would be the most serious one, and number five would be the less serious one. So uh, let's let's take let's take uh, two minutes uh, for you to do that, uh, if you don't mind. We obviously won't wait for everyone, but just um, just the first few. Okay, and I can see COVID-19, stroke, cancer, AIDS, heart disease, malaria, murder. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. You can stop now. And uh, so let me move to the next slide. Okay, so, so this was... This was published in, in uh, our social media, and that's why I have the the big red caution sign at the bottom. Um, but um, that was published in April 2020. And as you can see at that time, and I think this is correct, we had about three COVID-19 deaths on average per day, okay? When I looked at the statistics this morning, it was standing on 129 uh, cases, exactly what was then uh, uh, the cancer death cases per day. Um, and, and, and there are three things I really want to highlight and don't get too bogged down with these figures. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things. First of all, it's, it's quite, quite interesting to see that, that uh, you know, each one of you uh, put different causes as the major cause of death, uh, which means uh, we have a subjective way of looking at risk. So, so uh, risk perception is different from one person to, to another. Another thing I want to highlight is that risk tend to change. Okay. So uh, it doesn't say the same, that the risk that we perceive in April is different from the one we seeing in July. So, so that means our risk assessment process um, is a continuous process. It's not something that we do at a point in time and we forget about it. We always have to adjust, we always have to change because the circumstances change. So risk is not constant. Um, so, so, so I think that's the main thing I wanted to I wanted to to bring across. Then remember, with especially with hazardous biological agent, that tend to change. And what was true two three months ago is not true anymore today. So we have to look at projected risk, not just at, at the current situation, but also at what we're going, what we're projecting for the future. So we have the risk perception, which is very much often can be subjective. We have a risk assessment process, which is more a methodol methodological a kind of process of getting all the information in a systematic way to assess the risk. And then we have a, a, a phase where we actually try to manage the risk. 
So in a nutshell, what is a health risk assessment? It's an information gathering and review process leading to valid and informed judgment about health hazards and risks, taking steps to achieve and maintain adequate control, and also risk assessment help us to make decisions about workplace monitoring and health surveillance. Two very important concepts uh, regarding a risk assessment is the concept of hazard and risk. So hazard and risk are not the same thing. If we look at COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 virus, we know what it does, okay? Nowadays, we know what more or less what the symptoms and what the diseases are. Um, so this virus, for example, cannot cause cancer or diabetics or something like that. The hazard is more or less fix, intrinsic, it doesn't change. What does change is the risk. The risk is the probability or the likelihood that we will get the disease, that we will um, be harmed. So the risk changes, and this is really what the risk assessment is all about, is finding the special circumstances that, that can bring to an exposure. So what is the hazard? If we look at the virus SARS-CoV-2 that we're talking about, uh, we have the, in the hazardous biological agents, uh, we have four hazard groups going from the least hazardous to the most hazardous. And if we look at the criteria in Group number four, it's um, an agent that causes serious human disease. There is a high risk of spreading to the community and there is no effective, effective treatment prophylaxis for that agent. So I believe we can actually put at this point in time, a SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19 into hazard group number four, which is the most serious one. When it comes to calculate and prioritizing risks, there are two things in essence that we look at. One is the hazard, and we've already spoken a little bit about that. So what are the consequences? If I'm exposed to this virus, what will be the consequences? Okay, the consequences might be death. And obviously, in many cases, it's not, but in some cases, so what is the seriousness of that? And then we have to look at the probability or the frequency of exposure. What are the chances that I'm going to be exposed to that virus? What is the probability? And that the hazard together with the exposure will give us our risk. So when it comes to trying, trying to quantify the risk, again, we're looking at the health hazard rating, which for COVID-19 probably will sit at four or five, down there because it's a high um, hazard rating, a high serious consequences in terms of exposure. And then we look at the exposure rating. So this will change according to the circumstances. And, my, and the next presenter is going to speak more to that. So the exposure rating, again, can be very low or very high depending on the circumstances. And then when those two meet, the health hazard and the exposure rating, that is where we get the risk. It can be a low risk, a medium, or a high risk. And in a similar vein, we can also look at vulnerable workers. So we, 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 we can't put all the employees in the same basket we as we know we have 
workers, we have employees which are more vulnerable, and also we have high risk exposure groups. So for example, we take a health care worker that is dealing with COVID-19 patients, is going to fall into high or very high exposure risk group. And if this particular worker is over 60 and has got diabetics as well, then he's going to be a vulnerable worker and is probably again going to be in a very high employee vulnerability group. So, so if we take those two, he's going to be sitting probably in the red, uh, something that we need to pay special attention to. The basic steps of a biohazard risk assessment will be to identify the agent and, and assess the hazard, look at the activities that are taking place and the workers, the special, uh, you know, if we have special cases, like I've mentioned, then the next step will be to, to prioritize the risk. Is it high, medium, low? Next, we're going to see what we can do about it. We have to implement some control to mitigate, to reduce the risk. And then there is a process of evaluation and review. And, and as, as you can see, this is a cyclical process. It's a continuous process. As things change, we need to reevaluate the risk. Okay. In terms of risk control, what I would like to say, this is a very, very, a very important principle in, in, in occupational health, which is the hierarchy of control. And, and the best way to get rid of a risk, eliminate risk, is to prevent it altogether. This is the first price, but not always possible. Then we have to look at engineering controls. And when I say engineering controls, these are things like ventilation, automation, things like that. Administrative controls include things like training, operating procedures, medical surveillance, and things like that. And then the last resort is personal protective equipment. Why is it the last resort? Because PPE doesn't actually take the source of exposure away from the workplace. It, it also depends on workers complying with, with, with that. And also, you know, PPE can only be effective if it's fitted properly and, and, and if it is used continuously throughout the shift. And a next presenter, um, is going to talk more about PPE. That's a very important topic, although it's not, it's the last resort, like, like we've said. Often, it's the only resort, the only thing that we have in a particular, in particular circumstances. So in terms of intervention to control a risk from hazardous biological agents, we, we often mention the, the chain of infect, infection from the pathogen into the host. If we can break the chain of infection at any point, then we will prevent the infection. And there are different ways to do that. Like we've said, we've got engineering controls, work practices, protective equipment, immunization, which we don't yet have for this particular virus. I just want to quickly cover some of the legal requirements in terms of hazardous biological agents risk assessment. And the first one, and the most important one, is not new, is the hazardous biological agents regulations from 2001. Those regulations are still valid, and we need to follow them. And they are really in terms of biological ages, our, our Bible, if you want to put it that way, this is, this is where, what we refer to. And then there are a couple of directives that came out recently that basically reinforce what is stated already in the hazardous biological agents. For example, 
that when we do a risk assessment, our health and safety reps and committees must be in the picture before the assessment, during the assessment, and they might and, and then they must also be um, aware of the findings. The risk assessment must be recorded and there are particular things that we need to record, like for example, the nature of work and processes, the nature of the hazard that we're dealing with, in this case, SARS, coronavirus 2, who might be exposed and how, and what are the existing control measures that we have in order to mitigate, to control, to reduce the risk? And is there any potential for them to fail at any point in time? Another legal requirement is that the risk assessment must be done by a competent person. And what is a competent person? Now, the hazardous biological agents originally doesn't define clearly what is a competent person. The directive that came recently gives a bit more light on this topic. So it's something that really needs to understand the risk assessment process. It is someone who is familiar with the hazardous biological agents regulations. It is someone that knows about this particular hazard that we're dealing with and how to control it. Now, who can do the risk assessment? You're probably going to ask the next question. It can be done in-house, but there is a recommendation that a registered occupational hygienist or a safety professional should, be, should get involved in this process. Again, we have the hierarchy of control, a very important principle, like we've said, and this applies to the standard precautions that we apply and also to the transmission-based precautions. So we have to look at the general practices that apply to any biological agents and also to look specifically at the transmission route or, 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 or pathways for this particular virus. There is also a requirement to review, review the assessment if for any reason we feel that what we've done is no longer valid, we have to relook at the assessment. If the workplace conditions like methods, equipment, the procedures have changed, which might impact the exposure, then we have to redo our risk assessment. If we have a COVID-19 case, then again, this will trigger a risk assessment. And always remember a risk assessment, we're going to say it again and again, is an ongoing process. It's not something that ends and, and that's it. You know, we have to always go back and refine it and improve it and take into consideration the new circumstances. Another directive that came out in May is the COVID-19 walkthrough risk assessment. This is a very, very good tool for you to use. The purpose is to assess the risk of exposure, to assess the effectiveness of existing controls, and also to inform employers and employees of the potential risk and what additional control measures can be implemented. And this is in the form of a checklist so here you can see part of it and they are basically different areas that we need to address and and i will quickly go through those areas education training and awareness what are the hygiene measures that we are applying the issue of physical or social dis distancing what engineering controls are in place what administrative controls, the personal protective equipment that we are using, safe work practices, how do we deal with waste, safety equipment like first aid and things like that, 
in emergency response procedures. What happens if we get a COVID-19 case in the workplace? What do we do next? Areas that we need to prioritize in our risk assessment, and, and here are just some examples, the entry and exit point to the workplace, change house facilities, canteen and dining area, areas, waiting areas, and places like training areas and conference rooms, uh, these areas should get a priority when it comes to the health risk assessment. So I'm almost finished and before I finish, I just would like to highlight some of the special problems that we have when it comes to hazardous biological agents risk assessment. So one of them is that there is no threshold of safe level of exposure. That means that even one agent, one virus potentially can cause the disease. There are no exposure limits like with the hazardous chemical agents where we can find a limit of exposure. There are no such limits for biological agents. Why? Because biological agents propagate. We find one and then the next minute we find 20. So there can't be an exposure limit. Hazardous biological agents are common in the environment. So we can find biological agent, agents such as viruses, bacteria, fungi in any kind of environment. There are still uh, uncertainties regarding the routes of exposure. So we know basically how we can expose to this virus, but there are still some discussions, research about the importance of each route, the droplet route, the airborne route, the contact route. We have different routes of potential exposure. We also have the, the individual susceptibility and the issue of vulnerable workers. So as mentioned before, you know, we have workers in our workforce, they are more susceptible, more vulnerable, and we have to consider those uh, very, very carefully. And then we have the issue of limited resources for risk mitigation. I think we are aware of it. For example, the issue of respirators. So there are different respirators with different protection factors, and we have to uh, give the equipment with the highest protection to the highest risk workers. And uh, later, on, we, later on, we're gonna we're gonna speak more and uh, about about PPE. So guys, I think that's it from my side. I've got a, one question for you. Why do we do a risk assessment? Maybe you can quickly put one word or two words in your chat box. And uh, this is my word. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Thank you. So thank you very much, Kabi. Um, as informative as always, and also very interesting in terms of the media that you use and your engagement of our participants. I'm sure they're still gonna give you some answers in the chat box. And that was uh, Gabriel Mizan from our occupational hygiene section. I'm going to just check if um, Dikiledi Matuka, our colleague in the uh, microbiology section, is uh, online. Um, Chicka Lady, are you on? Yes, Ashwa. Thank you very much for confirming. If you could just prepare your slides in a moment. So I now welcome my colleague, uh, Chicka Lady Matuka, uh, who's going to deal with bio-risk assessment of two for COVID-19. And uh, she is from the microbiology uh, and, um, did I say that correctly? No, immunology and microbiology section. Thank you, Chicka Lady. Welcome. Please proceed. 
Thank you, Ashraf, um, and Gabby for having set the scene on bio-risk assessment. So I'm going to carry on with the bio-risk assessment tool for COVID-19. This is a generic tool just to give guidance on what steps to follow when conducting risk assessment. And Apologies for interrupting. I don't think you've shared your presentation yet. I shared. I did share. Share. Okay, so the, just for a reminder, please, people, type your question and answers in the Q and A box. Sorry, your questions in the question and Can answers box. Yes, thank you, lady. It's on now. Yes, oh, please proceed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I was just saying, I'm just gonna carry on with the tool and it's a qualitative tool and it's more generic. So there are other tools that uh, can be used that are quantitative, as Gabby mentioned. So this is just to guide you on, on, on the tool. You can use other tools that are sector specific. And so when you do risk assessment, the first step is to anticipate the risk before you do risk assessment. And then you start identifying uh, the risk. So we already know that the agent is the SARS-CoV-2. And it can also contaminate other surfaces such as your equipment. And then you do find it from the infectious uh, people as well as the samples or body fluids that are taken from those that are infected. And the next step is then to look at the transmission pathway. We know that it's via contact or respiratory droplet. And as Tanusha mentioned recently, this week, the airborne transmission has been acknowledged. So this means that once uh, it's been approved, then we'll have to review our risk assessment and include the airborne transmission. Then the next step is to decide who will be affected. So that will be your worker or your host. Then you look at a few, uh, several factors, which, is, which include your risk occupation. So different uh, job tasks will have different risk profiles. So that has to be looked at. And then you look at the risk factors that may put a worker at higher risk of exposure such as your elderly people who are older than 60, and then your comorbidities, which include your hypertension, chronic lung diseases, liver diseases, and so on. So this exposure will lead to the health effect. We know it's infection, which is uh, the COVID-19. And then the next step is to look at your environment. That's where you're gonna identify the high risk areas and then you decide what control measures you already have in place and if you may need additional controls which ones to add on once you have your findings of the risk assessment you record all your findings implement the findings and review and update your risk assessment regularly also to emphasize that risk assessment is a multidisciplinary effort because you need different expertise for, for environment and engineering. For example, you need your engineers and your occupational hygienist for, for your knowledge on the microorganism itself, you need microbiologists. And then for clinical aspects, that's where you will need your occupational medicine specialist. So it's, 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 a, it's a combined effort of all disciplines. So this is just examples of control measures that can be put into place. I'm not gonna go through the whole slide, but I'll just emphasize the steps of hierarchy of controls that needs to be taken into consideration. We cannot eliminate the virus itself. However, we can minimize 
exposure to the virus by ch changing certain procedures in place by replacing them with less um, risk, with less um, activities that has uh, that uh, have lower risk. And then the next one is your administrative control. So every workplace has to ensure that they have policies in place and then they keep social distance, as we know, and ensure that all staff are trained on the hazards and risk. And they have like your sanitizers in the workplace, adequate supply of sanitizers. For environment and engineering, then you consider your cleaning and disinfection procedures, ensure that there's adequate ventilation where people gather, and then each workplace must have an isolation room in case of emergency response, where they will isolate those uh, that are suspected or, or those that are uh, showing symptoms in those homes. Behavior is also important. Workers have to be informed of the importance of preventing exposure. And they need to be cooperative with the employer as well as the authorities that are putting directives in place. And then they have to be informed also not to touch their uh, noses, nose, mouth, and eyes, and to practice respiratory and hand hygiene uh, practices as well as proper donning and doffing of PPE. So compliance from the uh, employees is important. And lastly is your PPE. PPE shouldn't be just given to anyone. To give workers PPE, that should be informed by your risk assessment. So you will look at the task that the person performs, and you will decide from there whether the person need PPE and what type of PPE they need. And the workers must also be um, informed or made aware that PPE does not replace social distancing. So social distancing must still be observed and then PPE must not be shared between the workers. And that PPE that those that are reusable must also be cleaned or disinfected. So the Department of Employment and Labor have categorized uh, risk in different groups, four groups. They ha you have your very high group, and those are the ones that are conducting aerosol generating procedures, either using samples or in the cases of suspects. And examples are your healthcare and laboratory workers. The high risk group include Healthcare workers that are not generating procedures, however, they include also support staff, such as your, your porters and those that, that do cremations uh, in the mushrooms. The medium exposure group are all high volume settings that comes into contact with intruders, either with the suspect or those that with unknown status. And your examples are your schools and universities, your police stations, uh, your retail shops, et cetera. And the last group is your low category. And those are the ones that have no contact within two meter with no COVID case or suspect. So basically they have minimal contact with the workers or the general public. So before starting risk assessment, the first step is to have your checklist. And then it must be done by a competent personnel before the work starts or when there is change either in procedures, change in equipment, or when there have been an incident or a case identified of, of COVID-19, then risk assessment has to be redone. So evaluation can either be quantitative, as, as I've mentioned, by either classifying it as high, medium, or low, or it can be quantitative by using a risk score matrix. And expert advice may be needed in some instance. So we're just gonna go through two examples, applying this generic tool on how you go about to identify risk in the workplace. So we've chosen the, the um, education sector. So I just want to highlight, I just mentioned a few examples here. When you do risk assessment, start at the beginning 
So if now you have allocated a teacher who is doing, who's receiving students, who's screening students and taking temperatures, you have to start there at that point to check uh, exposure. So you record the activities that they do. You say temperature monitoring, then you, you say what control measures you need for that. Then you say uh, maybe screening and so on. So here we have teaching of learners. The people who will be affected will be your educators in schools and your lecturers in either colleges or universities. So we know the hazard is uh, SARS-CoV-2, but you can get indirect exposure also either through the workers, if you don't know the co-workers are, are infected through contaminated surfaces and equipment or when coming to contact with uh, infected learners. The, the route of infection of transmission currently is contact. So when airborne is, is being um, approved and it will be added as another route of exposure in your risk assessment. So health effect, you mentioned that it's COVID-19, which present with all different symptoms. So your baseline controls will be the controls that you already have. As we had prepared when returning to work, we did uh, try to put some, some measures in place. So you will list all those measures in, the, in this column. Examples there are now changing from face-to-face -face meetings and having visual meetings. Or, or you can opt now to have outdoor classes where possible, where there is enough ventilation and exposure to sunlight. So your residual are those that you have to add on that you're lacking. For example, here, if you haven't done the identification of vulnerable workers in, in your workplace, now is the time to do it. And then you will decide who's responsible for this because in your action plan, you need to say who's responsible to attend to this. And then you give the timeline of when it must be done. So, and then you rate your risk based on the control measures that you have and what you you lacking. So, depending on how you weigh the risk, then in this instance, we rated it as medium. But just to also mention that once you have done your individual risk assessment of, of those who are vulnerable, you may be uh, reducing your rating from medium to low. So try to reduce your, your risk as much as possible in order that you can lower the, 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 the rating of exposure. So for teaching of learners in the class, it's less likely that you will have a washing basin. So for a teacher that you'll probably need a sanitizer in that room. Whereas when a person is going or a teacher is going for lunch, then there will be a basin there for washing hands. And then while doing the marking of assignment and test, your books and other uh, materials, paper materials, can be the source of exposure. So should the teacher be using gloves to, to prevent exposure? If they are going to use gloves, it means they have to change gloves, either per learner or per book, in order to minimize cost contamination. So that also will not be practical or cost effective. So it will be better to probably use uh, the hand sanitizer instead of gloves for, for, for that purpose. And then we, you may have also additional measures such as avoiding mixing of glasses so, so that to minimize exposure if there, there will be a possibility of learners being exposed. So another activity is receiving of school fees. This, this is in the finance uh, office can either be through cuts and, and cash when people come uh, physically and then the receipts and invoices that are exchanged between the employee and, and the customer or the parents that spend school fees. So your finance officers or clerks can be exposed as well. So you may want to opt or if you don't have already put in measures of making appointments with those that don't have online uh, resources to, to deposit the money or debit account or having bank, banking apps to, to pay the school fees. Make appointments or rearrange uh, 
make rearrangement for for face to face payments. I've seen one school they've opted for now instead of their parents going inside their staff room, they waiting outside, queuing outside, and they're paying via the window, the barrier, a window barrier to to minimize exposure of the worker. So another example is of construction workers. Um, so there, I just put it generic. It will be the same principle. When you do the risk assessment, you split your activities by job type and by activity. As other people can have the same post or position, but they might be doing different activities. So you may want to go through that, those activities. So it can either exposure be via uh, co-workers or equipment or pens and papers as they do administration. So your, your, the risk profile will differ between project managers, your site managers, foreman, or the actual con construction worker. So depending on what the person does. A person who's on site, for example, will be more at a higher risk of exposure than the project manager will probably only visit the site once, but it's most of the time in their offices. So it's important to categorize the, 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 the risk of, for, for different people, as mentioned. Then principle is the same. You list all baseline controls. You may want to stagger the lunch between workers and ensure ad adequate ventilation because we know in construction there are many workers in, 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 in at one site at the same time. So if you haven't done the risk assessment already, it's important because this helps you to identify the risk and put uh, proper control measures in place. So this is why here we, we rated it as um, high risk because you may be missing those um, measures or mitigation strategies that are important that has to be in place. So once that is done, your risk may be lowered either to medium or low, depending on, on, on your observations and what uh, residual controls you implement. Uh, you may want to reduce the number of workers uh, on, at the site or wherever, because in case you get a, a case, only a few will be affected and uh, production can still carry on while you have other groups. Uh, or, or on site or in the, at the workplace, or, or, or decide to um, have same shift teams. So here it means that you have the same people or same individuals in the same team. Instead of rotating teams like changing individuals in in a team, team that may 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 um, uh, put more workers at risk of exposure. So if you get the, the, the cases, you're going to have more cases instead of having a few, and then that work can, can carry on. So during transportation of workers in the construction, the drivers uh, it can be at risk as well as the workers because you'll have a few workers in the, in the transportation. Uh, and then, but the driver may, may be at less risk because they probably have a, a separate compartment, which is deep, uh, separate from the workers who will be together, for example, at the back of the party. So uh, workplaces or employers have to come up with ways on, of minimizing um, exposure of workers in, in during transport, either by having maybe a few um, in the transport, following the directives by the Department of Transport, avoiding crowding within those, those uh, vehicles, and then provide sanitizers in the vehicles for the workers, and ensure that they always wear their uh, uh, masks to, to minimize uh, uh, um, transmission. So here you, will, you won't need hand washing because during transportation there's no access to water. So sanitizer will be your, your best option. So here the risk will be minimum because if you haven't trained the worker, they might be doing the wrong things. So make sure they are trained on their hazards and risk and to comply with the policies that are being put in place by the employer, then you may minimize your risk to the low uh, 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 risk. So common errors that are made during risk assessment is that it's, it's, it's often seen as a once-off process, and 
risk assessment is an ongoing process. It's not a tick box exercise. When doing risk assessment, you have to physically go in and observe what the worker does and note the activities as explained in the, in the tool, you record all the information that's needed. So sometimes workers are not involved and actually workers can give you enough information on what they do because it may happen that on the day that you're doing risk assessment, they may be skipping a certain step of their activity. So they may tell you that additional step. And the workers must also be encouraged to report when they, they suspect additional risk that maybe has been missed during the risk assessment. And they may also be encouraged to report if they have any symptoms and so on. So risk assessment is either usually not documented or it, it is outdated. So we have to make sure we keep updating the risk assessment as we get new information updated, as, as changes happen, uh, review it and update your risk assessment and make sure you document it. And um, it's sometimes not assessed fully due to limited expertise or in, in, in this field. So you may want to seek uh, expert advice or external advice Preventive hierarchy of controls are important. Also, they should be taken into consideration. So other things to consider is that we must know that microorganisms are everywhere. That's why we say we cannot eliminate them completely. And then they are also invisible. They cannot be seen. So we have to make sure that um, we minimize the risk at each point of chain of infection, preferably at the source. But if that fails, then at the host or at the, the environment. There is no standardized checklist for risk assessment. As I've said, this is just a generic tool. There are other tools you may already have sector specific in your workplace that you can do. So you, you have to adapt it by your specific sector. And most importantly, high risk groups, those are that are vulnerable and your high risk areas that you have identified in your workplace must be prioritized. So it's important that risks must be communicated to everyone in the workplace, including your workers. They must know of the hazards and risk and what you as the employer have put in place to make sure that they are protected. And then management must also be involved as they, they develop policies for the company and then they can they also provide resources. After you identify the risk and you see the gaps that needs to be filled, you need money to do that. So management has to be involved also for that reason. Everyone that's involved also in this COVID response, your, your bio risk management committees, your safety and health and environment people, your IPC and your uh, COVID-19 task team must also be involved in, in, in this uh, communication, as well as external uh, advice can be sought when needed. So while we implement in these control measures, we must ensure that we train workers on how to apply or use PPE. You can see from the slide that face shield has been provided to the workers, but they are not using them properly. And then, when we do disinfection of surfaces, also we have to ensure that we are not exposing the workers to other hazards, such as your chemical hazard. You will see in this picture, the worker is, is decontaminating the trolleys, but he doesn't have the gloves on, he doesn't even have the respirators on. So we have to ensure that we train them. If he has been given, he's not using, then we need to retrain the staff. But if there isn't PPE provided, employer must make sure the worker is provided with the PPE. So in conclusion, we, we must anticipate the risk, identify, record, and review on a regular basis. And we must include individual risk assessment to check the, to identify the vulnerability of each of the worker as they that can, can uh, uh, up their uh, risk of exposure. And then employers must ensure that they have policies in place for workers and for the public that come to visit the, the, the uh, 
workplaces or facilities. And then we ensure that we implement practical mitigation strategies where necessary and follow the hierarchy of controls. Employees must also be vigilant and always informed as the information keep changing. We need to keep abreast with new developments so that we can update our policies and uh, improve our control measures. So uh, risk assessment needs to be updated also when there is changes as mentioned in procedures, in equipment, or in when new information comes in, when you have new cases. And lastly, risks must be communicated and workers must be informed as well as the public. That's it for me and I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dikaledi. That is Dikaledi uh, Matuka. Uh, Dikaledi is part of our, um, uh, let me get this right, immunology and microbiology section. Okay, um, Dikaledi, I'm not sure if your microphone is still on. Um, so thank you for, the, for that. It is the bio-risk assessment tool that Dikaledi had taken us uh, through in detail. And all of these presentations and the video and audio recording of the session will be available on the NIH's website and you'll be able to secure that once it's uploaded sometime today or, two, or, or on Monday. Okay, so our next uh, presenter, and I just want to check, uh, Martin, um, are you there? Are you online? Could you just unmute your microphone, Martin? Okay, there we go. It's unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you now, yes. Um, are you ready okay. to share your uh, uh, presentation screen with us? Yes. Okay, so while you're yes, doing that, please do, thanks. So our next presenter is Martin van der Merwe from Protechnic, and uh, he's kindly joined us today. We thank him for uh, sharing his uh, knowledge and information on testing of respiratory protective equipment that's RPE effectiveness. Thank you, Martin. Please proceed with sharing your presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation? Not yet, Martin. You've got to click the share. You've got to open your presentation, and once it's open, you click the green share button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and it'll um, highlight for you everything that's open, and you just need to select your presentation, click on that, and then you need to open it up to maximize the screen. So if your presentation is open, click the green button at the bottom, that way it says share, sc share, share screen, and that button will give you a box with all the icons of the um, things that you have open and you choose the specific box or icon that is your presentation and you double click and you click share the little blue share button on the bottom right okay you're starting to share your screen now we can see it coming up and you got to click your specific presentation there you are and if you can maximize that at the bottom for to slideshow and then you will have the full screen version. Okay, everything okay? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, so I can continue. Yes, you, you may want to maximize your, there you go, thank you very much. So thank you for joining us, Martin, and thank you for um, sharing your, your uh, information with us on the, uh, the testing of respiratory protective equipment. Please proceed, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, as I understood, is that there's some um, uncertainty how the approval process work and how the testing is work for working for the respiratory protection equipment. So I'm going to address the different role players in the approval process, as well as the different standards. Um, also look at the different products and the descriptions and then also explain the different tests that we do on the different respiratory protection equipment. 
Uh, first of all, um, we are from Protechnic, Protechnic Laboratories. Our main purpose is to do testing. We, we are part of the AMSCO group, which is part of uh, the Department of Defense. So we uh, totally independent from, from the other regulators. And um, the next one is the NRCS. Uh, to make it simple, they they will give approval or, or let the, uh, the um, a sales permit, and uh, then there are Supra, which is more for the medical products, uh, where they will give a license for the different products, and then there are the SABS. The SABS is not um, really for approval for the different products. They do uh, however certifications and they um, do the adoption and comp compilation of standards. And uh, so, but the most important thing, if, if somebody wants to approve a product, they must first come to ProTechnique so that we can do the test. With our test report, uh, the people can then go to, to one of the regulators. Um, these are mostly the standards that is currently applicable. Uh, we work according to the SANS 5149. Uh, that is your N95 and FFP2 type of uh, products. Uh, then we work often with um, SANS 1866. That is mostly for your surgical mask and medical respirators. The standards that we use there is the 1866-2008, the 1866-2018 of part one, 1866-2018 part two. Um, the biggest difference between the part one and part two is that the part one is the normal three-ply surgical mask, where the part two is a, a tight-fitting respirator that is very similar to, to the SANS 5149 product. Then we also have the SANS 51827 and the SANS 5140. They are half masks um, and they are reusable. Uh, the difference between the, between the two is the uh, or how you can separate them from the others is that it's a, like a silicon rubber body with replace, replaceable filters. There's also other standards involved, which is not uh, South African standards. Uh, one that you will often see is the EN14683. Uh, it is for surgical masks and uh, it's mostly a cover bacteria filtration efficiency. Then there's also the ASDM F2100. It's similar to the previous one, but it also includes a particle filtration efficiency. Then there's the G2626. That is a Chinese specification and um, the, that is similar to our SANS 5149. They do have, if I only do the, the sodium chloride filtration efficiency, where our SANS standard include the paraffin oil uh, filtration efficiency. Also G2626, a slightly different test parameters, but, but you, can, you can compare it to our uh, SANS 5149. Uh, then there's the NIOS specifications. Uh, that is the American specification and, and um, the, the, the product that you will see the N95 and the N95 is uh, normally the, the, the NIOS specification. And then the other one that you will see often is EN149. That is exactly the same as the SANS 5149. The, the SABS adopted the 149 and um, put on the SANS 5149 um, 
a number on it. If I can come to the products, the products that we mostly get in for testing is the surgical mask, medical respirators, uh, the particle filtering mask, and the half mask. But I will go to each of them in detail now. <coughs> the surgical mask is also known as a three-ply mask or a medical face mask. The, the medical face mask is what we use in our sun specification. You will see in the sun's uh, one eight double six of part one, they refer to the, the medical face mask. But if you look at the picture, that is what a, a typical surgical or three ply mask will look like. Uh, it is a loose fitting uh, product and it provides protection against uh, larger droplets. Uh, it is also important to, to understand it, it will not protect the user against small particles. It is more to protect the, the, the persons to, in your close environment. Mm -hmm. It's not designed to, to give protection against smaller particles. Also because it's loose fitting, particles can, can uh, penetrate uh, between the mask and, and, the, and the face because it doesn't give a proper face seal. Uh, many of the products are classified as sterile and non-sterile. It is not specifically addressed in the, the, the sun specifications. Um, and I'm also not sure and I, I, I did not see test methods how you can distinguish between the two. Um, all these masks should give protection against bacteria and, and must be splash resistant. Um, the sterile mask is, is, is um, classified by SAPRA as a class one, class A medical device and it needs a li license. So all these products in a South African sense will fall under the SANS 1866-2018 part one. And then there's the second group of the medical mask. It is the medical respirator. It looks very similar to the particle filter, uh, the, the SANS 5149. And um, it's also known as the, the medical KN95 and some also refer to it as, as, a, as a surgical N95 respirator. It is a tight fitting uh, product and it gives ba a barrier against submicron particles. The previous one that I just mentioned, the, the three ply mask, does not necessarily give protection against submicron particles. Um, the, the, the product that I mentioned, that is uh, the previous specification of the 1866 to 2008, they do, however, address submicron particles. Uh, this product must be pre approved by, by the NRCS and, uh, and it needs a separate, separate license to be distributed. And this product will fall under the SANS 1866. 2018 part two. It's, it's a bit difficult to distinguish between this and uh, the 5149 because on the mask, you will, I, I never saw any mask that, that where you can see the marking SANS 1866 2018 part two. The only way that you can identify this is on the box, normally they, they, they will state medical k in 95 then we have the the sans 5149 product um, people know that in different names um, it's known as a ffp2 ffp3 the ffp2 and ffp3 is the south african classification 
which you will find in the Psalms 51 for 9. Strictly speaking, that is what we're supposed to talk about in, in South Africa. Although the people also know it as the N95 and N99, which is which is coming from the NIO specifications, and it's also known as the KN95, which is the, the Chinese classification. This is a tight-fitting uh, mask, uh, which will give a barrier against submicron particles. We test it against um, between 0.3 and 0.6 micron. And for a FFP2, for example, uh, not more than 6% of particles are allowed to penetrate through this uh, filter. I also heard that some people um, call this the ultimate standard. They, they refer to this 5149 as the golden standard. So that is something that most people aim for. The, the, big, the biggest difference between this one and the previous product that I was talking about, that, that Suns 1866 part two, the medical um, respirator, is that this one is, is really a tight fitting mask. It's also the only one, only standard that tests for, for, the, for, the, for the tight, tight fitness. We have a test that we call the total inward leakage where we can determine if particles will penetrate be between the face and, and the product. So for this product, you will need the, the NRCS approval. They will give you a sales permit if, if your test report from us comply to all the requirements. And what I recently understand is that SAPRA will also allow or accept this product to be um, uh, utilized in the hospitals. But the next speaker can, can confirm is, if that is correct. Uh, then we have the, the half mask that I, that I mentioned before. It's a reusable mask, but the reusable can be a confusing term because even if the it's only the body that is reusable, you must still replace the filters. It is a tight-fitting tight product, so it must also get a total inward leakage test, and um, it will give um, a protection against submicron particles. Um, it also needs the approval from the NRCS, but if it's being used in the hospitals, it must also go through to SAPRA. So you get basically the, the two types, the SANS 51827, and the sun's 51 for nine. The one that we get in mostly now is the, the first one, the 51827. Currently, um, none of these products are approved by the NRCS. Uh, most of the people in South Africa are, are busy with product, develop, product development. There are many companies that, that try to, to manufacture this now to distribute uh, where necessary. The biggest difference between these two products is that the 5187 uh, does not have any valves. So there's no inhal inhalation or exhalation valves incorporated. And uh, it mostly also have just have a thin um, filter disc that is replaceable. So the 51827 is mostly designed for the replaceable particle filter. Uh, SANS 5149 is, is, a, is a more advanced type of uh, half mask. Um, it consists of um, inhalation and exhalation valves, and you can fit in a, a, a more effective uh, filter. And it is not only particle filters, they also my provision for, for gas filters. So you will get your type A, B and C, and K, and also the AVAC uh, type of carbon cartridges that you can connect to this filter. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> coming to the cloth mask that is very popular now that most of the people on the street is currently use. They're also known as fabric mask. It is a reusable washable mask. It is loose fitting, but it should give barrier against um, larger uh, droplets, larger particles. Um, when you talk about the loose fitting mask, uh, it's mostly something that doesn't have a, a nose clip. You will see many of these uh, particle filtering half, um, half mask does have a nose clip so that you can make sure that you get a proper fill, uh, seal on the, over the nose. Um, over the nose is, is where most of the, the particles can, can leak through. But even if you have a, a nose clip in a, in a cloth mask, it will not guarantee that you will have a proper face seal. <clears throat> currently, this product is not regulated. I know that the SAB is currently, SAB is currently working on, on, a, on a test standard, but as I've, far as I know, it was not published yet. Um, there was, however, guidelines published. Uh, the, the DTIC published a, a standard and, and, and the, it was also published by the Department of Health. I, I, I assume it, it, it is the same um, document. Coming test methods for the SANS 1866 part one, that is now uh, our medical face mask, uh, the loose fitting mask, the one that I also said it is known as a a three-ply mask. That, uh, the test that we currently do on them is the, the submicron filtration. Uh, we're using sodium chloride as, as described by the SANS 1866 of 2008. Uh, we use the 2008, which is the previous specification because the latest one, the 2018 specification, they specify that you must use latex particles to do the particle penetration test. Um, Protechnic cannot do that test. And as far as I could um, investigate, there's very little companies in the world that, that, that do that test currently. And if, we will, if the suppliers or manufacturer want to send their tests overseas, I think it will also be very expensive to do so. For now, we will um, do the particle penetration using sodium chloride. We also do the flame resistance test. I think in maybe in terms of hospital use, it's not the most important test, but you don't know who else is going to use this mask. So it's just an additional safety precaution. Then we also do a water repellency test and that is just to ensure that the, the outer, outer layer of the mask will be record, liquid repellent. And then we do the flow resistance, uh, which is also known by some as the breathing, uh, breathing resistance, uh, resistance and some also um, call it the uh, pressure drop. Um, that is mostly for, for comfort purposes to make sure that a person will breathe easily through through a, a, a mask. Uh, then there's the SANS 28, 26, uh, 1866 part two, the medical respirator, which is a close fitting mask. And um, I, I don't know, maybe they use the word close fitting to distinguish from the 15, 5149, which is a tight fitting mask. Uh, currently, we also use sodium chloride to test it. Um, it's the same thing. Uh, it is also um, specified to use latex, latex particles, but we uh, will use the sodium chloride for now. Uh, we also do the flame resistance and the flow resistance. Um, the total inward leakage is, is not part of this specification. Then SANS 51 for 9, uh, which is called the, the tight fitting mask. In other words, it, it will uh, guarantee a good seal on the face. 
So how we differ, the particle penetration differ from the previous one that we also use uh, a paraffin oil penetration. The paraffin, paraffin oil is, is, is a smaller particle. And um, then also the flow resistance, flammability, practical performance. Uh, it is where we do different activities to, to see if, if you can wear it comfortably. And um, also to see if the if you still have a good field of vision, vision, you will maybe notice that some of the of these masks has a high um, bridge over the nose that can partly block your your field of vision, especially if you want to look down. And then the total in, inner leakage that is the only one only of these. Um, um, filter pro products that we do do the test on that is to check the face seal and what we do here we we have a cubicle where we create um, a certain concentration of sodium chloride then we have a person uh, walking on a treadmill with a mask on and while you're walking at six kilometer per hour you will do certain head movements and we will at the same time sample the, the outer atmosphere as well as the inside of the mask. And, and according to that, we can calculate the percentage that, that will leak into the, into the mask. And then there's the, um, the half mask that I was talking about, uh, the 51827. Uh, the testing that we currently do is exactly the same as for 5149. Uh, normally, there's some other tests also included in the standards, but for this COVID-19 COVID period, we agreed with the regulators that we just will do partial testing on, on all the products, not just this one. On all the products, that we will do part, partial testing. And uh, the idea was that we um, selected the most critical test and also um, the test that we comfortable was with doing with. And um, the reason is mostly that we can get out the reports as quickly as possible. What is important to remember of this half mask is that you, you, you cannot test a half mask on its own. That the, the, the filters are separate and why you separate the filters is that the, the filters has their own classification. Um, in, in, a, in this case for half mask, the, the classification will be a P1 or a P2 or a P3. And uh, we need uh, to test that filters then against the spec for, for, for these filter car cartridges or, or filter discs. Regarding the cloth masks, uh, as I mentioned before, that's, there's no previous standard, so there's no official test methods yet. And um, there are many people that, that request that we do, do, do it, and even if we tell them it will fail, they insist that we, we test it. So we use the SANS 1006 of 2008, because that is the most lenient um, specification, and uh, we will then evaluate the, the cloth mask according to the, the, this test. And uh, we will normally uh, not, not say pass or fail, we will list the tests and uh, we will just report the result and not put a pass or fail um, next to it. Because we can't pass or fail it because there's, there's not a specific standard. So in conclusion, um, during this COVID-19 testing, we aim to ensure that a good quality product to, to reach the healthcare workers. And currently we work on the partial testing of the standards to submit the test reports as quickly as possible. Currently, ProTechnic is currently totally overwhelmed with requests and we really um, have a hard time to to satisfy the needs of everybody. We work currently on a, 
on the turnaround time of 10 working days from the moment that we receive the report, uh, the, the samples until we can issue the, uh, the test report. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you very much, Martin. That's Martin van der Meeren from Protechnik, who's done quite a detailed um, uh, input there on the testing of respiratory protective equipment, the RPE effectiveness, quite a broad and detailed range of masks. I now have the pleasure of just checking if our next guest presenter, Momina Omerji, is online. Momina, are you online? <coughs> Yes, I am online. Thank you very much for confirming. If you could just get your presentation slides ready for sharing. So I have the pleasure of welcoming our next uh, presenta uh, presenter and uh, just a very brief bio, which um, I'm thank you to Jeanette for securing. Momina Omarji is currently the unit head of the names and scheduling at SAPRA section. She has over um, nine years of experience within the field of regulatory affairs for pharmaceuticals and medical devices, quality management systems, quality assurance, quality risk management, pharmaceutical production, complementary medicines manufacture, cannabis for medical use, proprietary names and scheduling of medicines, and in INCB policies and guidelines. Uh, Momen, Momeni, apologies, uh, Momina um, uh, received her Bachelor of Pharmacy degree at Rhodes University and um, the Masters of Science in the Regulatory Affairs from the University of the Western Cape and Hibernia College in Ireland. Uh, Momina started her career in pharmaceutical manufacturing, managing from a pharmaceutical production, distribution and packaging activities, progressing to quality assurance and the regulatory affairs in various pharmaceutical companies in South Africa over a span of 10 years. She has an overall holistic understanding of the pharmaceutical sector from both the regulator and industry perspective. So I, I welcome you. Um, Momina serves and participates in various national and global committees and working groups as a representative of, of SAPRA or the National Department of Health. Momina, that was a bit lengthy, but I think necessary. So thank you for joining us and making the time to share with us your presentation. If you could just change your presentation to the full screen, because at the moment we see your slide and your notes. Oh, my apologies. On my side, it's showing me the full screen. Yeah, I think you might agree. You have to close it again. There you go. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. So my topic today will be on the role of SAPRA and the licensing process for PPE uh, or medical device establishments in South Africa. I think Martin gave a really good background on um, you know, where masks and other sort of PPE fit in and the sort of standards that will be required for licensing of the establishment. Um, I'm just gonna go very quickly through who SAPRA is, what we do, the regulatory mandate, what we regard, um, what PPE we regard as medical devices, the classification of PPR and PPE when regarded as medical devices in terms of the masks, the gloves, the licensing requirements, the expedited pathways that we have put in place, and, and then we can just have maybe a few questions from there. So very quickly then, SAPRA, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, replaced the MCC or the Medicines Control Council on the 1st of February, 2018. At that point, we became a Schedule 3 a independent public entity um, with operational autonomy and accountability. The mandate and the responsibility of SAPRA has not changed from when we changed from the MCC to SAPRA, and we're still responsible for the regulation of medicines, including complementary medicines, medical devices, and uh, radiation control that now falls under SAPRA as well. Our activities are mandated and governed by Act 101, which is the Medicines and Related Substances Act, and the schedules and the regulations there too, together with the guidelines uh, made in terms of this act. We have very two distinct public health and regulatory mandates, which is to protect the patient against harmful or ineffective medicines or medical devices, and then to protect the patient against the consequences of any untreated disease. And that's where we speak about ensuring and enabling availability to medicines and medical devices and timely access. 
Um, and the first one then speaks to the sort of gatekeeper function with application of stringent requirements of quality, safety, and efficacy when it comes to medicines and then quality, safety, and performance when it comes to uh, medical devices. So do we regard PPE as medical devices? Yes, but when it falls within the definition of a medical device, and if one looks at the definition of a medical device, it's rather long. Um, and I haven't put it up here, but if you look at the definition of a medical device, it's when intended to treat, um, to cure, um, and it elicits no pharmacological action. So when we regard a PPE as a medical device, if I take, for example, a mask, it's when intended or indicated for use in a medical or healthcare environment. So the intention of use, I mean, sorry, the intended environment of use is, is important and also when it makes a medicinal claim or it claims to be sterile, um, then it would fall under a medical device and you are claiming that it's, um, it's keeping you safe or protecting you from viral infection. That's a medicinal claim or a therapeutic claim and therefore falls under the, the ambit of SAPRA. Why do we, why do we then uh, regulate this PPE as medical devices and it's the first mandate of SAPRA and the responsibility is to ensure the quality, safety and performance of the device and then also to ensure when the medical professionals and the public are using these products and they labeled as such to protect you from such and such that they are working as intended and um, they are not misleading the public. So we're ensuring that they are protected and they are safe at all times. So in, in the wake of the coronavirus and in when the coronavirus started, everybody was up in arms because we didn't have enough PPE. Um, not everybody was actually clued up as to when a medical device was regarded or when a PPE, sorry, was regarded as a medical device. Um, so when this need increased and the use of devices and the equipment to prevent the spread of coronavirus, we, we put out communications to industry um, and to all stakeholders on the regulatory status of such device and equipment. So we, we tried to communicate to the public and we tried to communicate to healthcare professionals exactly where um, one fits within the different regulatory jurisdictions. Um, one of the documents, um, and I haven't put it up here again, one of the documents we did publish was a joint communication with, with SABS and NRCS on the different regulatory pathways for, for uh, PPE. Um, and that included masks, it included gloves, it included sanitizers, um, and then it looked at, I think it had gowns, um, outer protective wear in it as well. So if that, that is a good read as to figure out the, the regulatory pathways, whether it falls under SAPRA, under the remit of SAPRA, um, whether it falls under the, the Foodstuff Cosmetic and Disinfectants Act, whether it falls under NRCS, or when you require certification versus when you do not require certification. But um, I know Martin has gone through it, but I'll just go through it very quickly again. So the general medical face mask and respiratory protective devices. So the, the classification of all PPE, and I'll say it um, quite a few times through the slide, is it falls into different regulatory groups depending on the type of the mask and the intended use of the face mask. And then again, the environment in which you're using it. So we've got, you've got, a general, you've got a general mask, which is your, your clot mask or your face masks. You've got the medical mask, which we call, you can call surgical masks, which are non-sterile. And those are regarded as class A medical devices. So when we classify medical devices, we classify them according to a risk classification. And it's class A, class B, class C, class D, with class B, I'm sorry, but class D being the highest risk medical device. So when you look at a non-sterile medical mask, that's a class A, that's a very low risk medical device. The next one is when you claim sterility on a medical mask and you're saying these specific masks are then to be used in a sterile environment and the product itself claims sterility, those fall under a subclass of class A, which is class A sterile. The, the respirator mask then falls under class B, which is a slightly higher risk. And that's due to also the intention of use and where you want to be using the respirator mask. The, the difference between the establishments, and I will get to the licensing um, and how the licensing 
um, regulatory framework works. But for now, when we look at class A and class A sterile and class B, if a manufacturer or an importer is either manufacturing or importing a class A product that does not claim sterility or measuring, you are currently exempt from the licensing requirement. So you do not have to license with SAPRA, but that does not mean you do not have to comply with the standards and the specifications that are set out. The licensing requirement falls away, but the standards and the specifications and the compliance to that still stand. Um, a class A sterile, so from a class A sterile and above, which is class B, you, are, you, you have to, the requirement is, and you mandated to, to um, get a license with a section 22C license with SAPRA. I don't know how clear that infographic is, but it's, it's also part of the joint communication that was sent out, which is a good summary of the different face masks and the classifications of them um, and when, he, when one would require a license from SAPRA, when one would require an NRCS permit, um, and also the different standards that are applicable to, to the specific mask. So if you look at the specifications, and then I'm going to say Martin has said it, when you look at a non-sterile medical surgical mask, one needs to comply with the SANS 1866. Um, and when you look at a sterile mask, it's the same. So you, you, the, the compliance to the standard is the same it's the licensing pathway that differs or the licensing requirement that differs. In terms of a respirator mask, um, the N95 or the KN95 or the FFP2s, you need, it needs to be compliance to the SANS 18622 for SABRA. And then when it's the, um, for use in, in a non-medical environment, it's compulsory specifications for the respiratory protective devices from the VC8072. So that, um, that's a, a good infographic to have a look at to say where these products can be used, can't be used, what are the necessary specifications or requirements, um, and then does one then require a license to manufacture or import these products. The next page um, kind of gives you a, an overview of the intended use and the purpose. So if you look at the cloth mask, for example, it says non-medical environment, um, it's there for respiratory hygiene and extension of coughing and sneezing etiquette. So there's no medical intention behind it in terms of it, it stops viral infection or it protects the patient from the wearer's respiratory emissions or vice versa. Because when you go and you look at um, under sterile medical or surgical masks, you see that this is for use in a clinical or healthcare environment and it needs to be fluid resistant. It needs to protect the wearer against large particle drop, droplets or sprays. Um, and it protects the patient from the wearer's respiratory emissions. So there is a, a medical element to it, and um, it is being used in a clinical and healthcare environment. So that's also, and if you look at the filtration portion, um, it also gives you what the filtration capabilities of that mask should be. And the last one is the use limitations of, of those specific products. Um, so the use limitations on the cloth mask is you need to wash it after each use. Um, Non-sterile is single use and disposable. And most of them are all single use and disposable. Um, as Martin said, you also get the ones where you, they, they can be reusable, but you've got to change the filters. If I move on then to um, surgical and examination gloves and general gloves, the same principle holds that the different regulatory groups um, depends on the intended use, um, the intended environment of use. And in this case, it's again, it's general gloves that you have. It's examination gloves that are non-sterile, which is a class A, and examination gloves which are surgical, and those that will be then a class B. So examine, um, your general gloves will be gloves that you use for, um, in a laboratory, for example. Examination gloves would be um, one that a healthcare professional would be using in a medical environment, um, and that could be sterile or non-sterile as well. The, they must equally comply with the tested methodology, I mean, the test methodologies provided in the different uh, South African national standards or the equivalent global standards, either the EN or the ISO standards as well. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the SANS 1193, which is the single-use medical examination gloves, um, and the SANS 68. 
for gowns, aprons, overshoes, or any other protective wear, this also falls into a medical device. And again, the same principle holds when the intended uh, environment of use and the intended use of the product. Um, surgical gowns, non-sterile, class A. Surgical gowns, sterile, class A, sterile. Um, other sh overshoes covers intended use is also falls under class A. Protective outerwear, aprons also fall under class A. But if you're claiming sterility on any of these products um, to be used in a sterile environment, um, then you've you, you, you immediately move up to the upper class, the subclass of class A sterile. And the, the ISO standard that's applicable in this case is the ISO 13688 for protective clothing. I'm not 100% sure what the SANS um, standard is at this moment. So the other thing that can be classified as a medical device uh, is sanitizers. So a surface sanitizer, um, a sanitizer for use on, a, on an inanimate surface um, in a low risk area is controlled under the ambit of the Foodstuff Cosmetics and Disinfractants Act. Um, and also they have NRCS and you have the, the, the compulsory specifications with the VC 8054 um, that needs compliance. As soon as you make um, the, a claim on this product that it kills viruses, or in this instance, it kills the coronavirus, um, and you're using that in a high-risk area, and your high-risk areas are your hospitals, are your cath labs, um, your, your ICUs, these are all high-risk areas where you've been using these disinfectants, these antiseptics, these germicides on inanimate surfaces, they would then be controlled, depended on the product itself, either as a class A or a class B medical device. So surface sanitizers, again, intended um, area of use and intention for use would determine under what class you fit and whether you do fall under a medical device or you fall outside the remit of Act 101 and, and SAFRA. So SAFRA's current licensing requirements specifies rather clearly and articulates clearly that any company or individual who intends to either manufacture, to distribute, um, and import and export fall under distribution, or wholesale a medical device or an IVD is required in terms of Section 22C1B of the Medicines Act to be licensed by SAFRA. So you may not um, conduct any of those activities, which is manufacture, distribute, wholesale, without a valid SAFRA medical device establishment license. Unless, as I said previously, that the products that you are either manufacturing or importing fall under class A, which then gives you an exclusion to the license requirement, but not an exclusion to the compliance of the certification. The following documents, and this is just a very succinct um, summary of, of what the licensing requirements are. So the documents that you should submit upon application to SAPRA, and this can be found on the SAPRA website and in the SAPRA guidances, the cover letter needs to be there to indicate what your intention is in terms of the license. Uh, you've got to submit a completed license application, and there's different applications dependent on, on what activity you're conducting, manufacturer, distributor, wholesaler. Uh, you've got to put the, the proof of payment as well, and there's different payment requirements in terms of a manufacturer, distributor, wholesaler, the CV of the authorized representative. So you have to have an authorized representative that has been um, selected by the specific company. You've got to submit the quality manual and your quality manual needs to have your quality management system and how the company approaches quality management systems um, in the company. Supportive evidence for each class C and D PPE listed, including. So sometimes a PPE can be regarded in a class C and a class D. Um, again, dependent on the intended use and what you're using it for. So if you do fall within a class C and a class D, um, you have to provide evidence of either pre-market approval or emergency use authorization or registration of that specific product in one of the six jurisdictions that SAPRA recognizes. Um, and those are the TGA, which is Australia, Health Canada, the FDA of America, um, Brazil, the EU, and Japan. 
Um, then you've got to, to submit a certificate of free sale confirming evidence that this product is actually then sold in that country, one of the countries I've just mentioned. You've got to have evidence of the ISO 13485 certification of the original manufacturer for each listed PPE. And the ISO 13485 is um, the quality, the certification for the quality management system of the original manufacturer. You've got to provide the instructions for use. You've got to provide the copy of the labeling and the packaging. So those are the requirements for the higher risk, which is the class C and the class D. In terms of a class A measuring or, or a sterile or and the class B, you then need to include um, so you don't need to include any of the above, but for the class A and B, you then need to include evidence of compliance against the minimum requirements and or certifications against the relevant standards and specs as determined by SABS, NRCS, or other global standards. <clears throat> that would hold for, for the C and D as well. So the, um, the difference between the A and the B and then the C and the D is that with the A and the B, you do not have to have all the other supporting evidence, but for the C and the D, you've got to have the pre-market approval because of the higher risk of the product. In terms of a wholesaler, um, it's a little less administratively restrictive. So you've got to appoint a qualified personnel, you've got to demonstrate compliance with good wholesaling practice and good distribution practice. For, for this application, um, you've got to then submit the site master file of the, the, the wholesaler and the activities that are performed. You've got to show us um, the agreements that you have with the distributor and that that distributor that you are buying from is then licensed with SAPRA as well. The product listings that you are going to be storing, your transportation, your dispatch, and, and how you would be selling those products as well. This is just a process flow, which can also be found in the guidance documents. I don't know how clear that is, but it's a process flow of, of the license activities and the review of the licenses at SAPRA. Um, so you see it goes through, you submit your application, it gets screened, it goes through um, an, a primary review process, it goes through a peer review process, and if everything and if all evaluation criteria are met, then it goes through to um, finalization and then signature by the CEO. The, the expedited pathway that was created or crafted by SAPRA um, for the COVID-19 COVID crisis and the pandemic um, is to provide support for monitoring and uh, a number of issues relating to medical devices, including uh, PPE and including IVDs as well. So we've, we've expedited a few of our regulatory pathways in terms of licensing and in terms of um, softening of some of the requirements. Uh, and then SAPRA is also committed to reducing the time taken to review and process license applications for medical device establishments from the routine six to eight weeks to 10 to 15 working days. But that timeline is wholly dependent on the quality and the robustness of the applications that are submitted to SAPRA. So if we receive incomplete applications, there's a lot of back and forth between applicant and regulator, which then increases that timeline to, to anything from, from 15 days to 30 days because of the lack of response from applicants and because of the lack of understanding as well um, of the, the documentation requirements. So that timeline to 10 to 15 days, if, if we receive a completed application with all the documentation requirements uh, submitted, all, this, all the compliance documents submitted and all the substantive evidence submitted, that's the timeline 10 to 15 working days from receipt to finalization of the, the application. Um, if you require any further information, you can either contact myself or you can contact Andrea. Um, and those are the relevant email addresses that you can contact. The other email address for um, PPE-related or, uh, or COVID-related applications can be submitted to a dedicated email address, which is mdcovid at sapra.org.za but that is specifically for COVID-19 related medical device license applications.
and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much, Momina. That's Momina Umarji that has done the role of SAPRA and the license process for medical devices. I'm going to ask Glenn just to put up the presentation for our next presenter to share, and that is uh, the head of occupational hygiene here at the NIOH, Jeanette Mangani, who's going to deal with the importance of respirator fit testing. So Jeanette, thank you for joining us today and for playing such a, a, an important role in coordinating particularly our external presenters. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Ashraf. And I think uh, my session will be very quick because I really want to appreciate Momina and uh, Martin who made my life very easy. In fact, uh, the two past presentations were meant to be embedded on mine. So I very much appreciate that you actually did justice for your presentation, much appreciated. So I'm here to talk about a concept on respirator fit testing, and uh, I would like to highlight why is it important. So um, I would like to start by defining what is it. I believe um, with Martin and Momina, you tend to differentiate the two concepts. They spoke about uh, filtration efficiency testing and so forth. So this concept of respirator fit testing is meant to determine if a specific respirator type or size and style fits a specific individual. So in other words, you don't fit test one person and you make an assumption that the whole group or the section or the unit will be fitted by the choice of one type of a respirator. So as a way of reminding, so what is a respirator in this case? So I think Martin spoke about surgical masks and their functions. So I will just run quickly through the explanation again. So the surgical mask by their design is to contain droplets from being expelled into the environment by the user during coughing, sneezing, or talking. We should note though that they do not prevent leakages around the edges. So those kind are loose fitting, therefore cannot be fit tested. So the ones that I'm talking about in terms of fit testing, those are the tight fitting respirators. They include, among others, the filtering face piece respirators. However, there are also some which are elastometric. We are aware of those ones that we put cartridges and so forth. But by, because of the purpose of COVID and what is relevant at this stage, we are gonna talk about filtering face piece respirator only. So this one are designed to achieve a tight fitting respirator face seal and provide a barrier between a user and a contaminated environment. So in order to achieve that performance requirement, fit testing needs to be conducted in order to confirm a, pro a proper fit. So again, there is also a confusion about uh, the difference between respirator fit testing and user seal check. So user seal check is required whenever the person put on a respirator every time. So in other words, you have a tight fitting respirator which is fitting and you have done fit testing. So every time you put it on, you will do seal check to make sure that it's sitting properly. So it's also very important to note that for each and every respiratory protective equipment, so in order to achieve the maximum uh, protection from it. According to um, the two presenters who, who, who talked before me, you have to make sure that the filter efficiency is, 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 is conducted and passed and approved. And then there must be a proper fit in terms of the individual proper seal and this prop, uh, equipment need to be properly used. In other words, people need to don it and be able to wear it during the entire shift so that they are protected from the potential hazard that they are using this respirator for. So in order to uh, ensure that tight fitting respirators are fitting people and employees or users are achieving the maximum protection from it, it is made possible by implementing an effective respiratory protective equipment in a workplace. Uh, program, my apology. So in this case, there must be a policy on respirator use, which is well supported by management. In other ways, they, 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 they provide uh, PPE for free at no cost. 
and where possible they allow uh, employers to select and um, and be involved in a selection and also be trained on proper use. So risk assessment is very important in this case because it will have to identify activities which are likely to expose employees to potential inhalation risk. So in that way, then the risk assessment will inform what kind of respiratory protective equipment is needed. Medical evaluation of employees is very important. There are many people who cannot work while wearing their respirators. So in this case, medical evaluation, it needs to be done to determine employees' ability to use their respirators or respiratory protective equipment. Ideally, this process should happen before people are fit tested. Selection of, crop, uh, of correct type based on a hazard is very important. Size and style also is very critical, which need to be matched with individual facial characteristics. It does not help to provide uh, employees with suitable respiratory protective equipment, and you don't train them and inform them on the use and limitation of them. Hence, it's very critical. So the topic that I'm presenting is respiratory fit testing, which is one of the elements of the respiratory protective program, which oftentimes is neglected, yet the other uh, elements, um, the employers pay more attention to it. And that is very important to note that this program and all these elements are selected because they are all important. So where respirators or equipment are being reused, it's very important that the maintenance, care, and including safe disposal of them is adhered to. So I just want to touch a bit on our legal requirements, what's happening in our country in terms of legislation. When we look at hazardous biological agents regulations, some of those elements which I spoke about, they were touched a bit. Like for example, that uh, the, the regulation, one of the requirements is saying that a relevant RPE, which is capable of preventing and control exposure should be provided. And it should be correctly selected and properly used. Information, instruction and training of supervision should be done in a workplace. And the equipment should be kept in a good working condition and efficient working order. So that is similar to maintenance. So, but what I want to bring to your attention is that at this moment, under hazardous biological agent regulation, the respiratory protective program is not included, although some elements have been addressed. And again, respirator fit testing is not explicitly mentioned. If you recall, um, Martin spoke about the South African national standards. And in this case, we're talking about part two. So if this standard get acknowledged in the regulation by virtue of that, it means all requirements will apply. For example, fit testing will form part of it and respiratory protective program will be part of it. So one may be asking, what methods do you use in order to do respiratory fit testing? There are two methods. One is qualitative, which is on my left hand, is the one that you get a kit and you use a challenge agent, it's either saccharin or Bitrex. I'm sure many of you who joined today are very familiar with this concept. And on my right hand, this is a quantitative uh, fit testing method, which make use of a, a number of equipment, but in this case, I'm projecting to you the pot account. This is the one that uses ambient particles in a room where it detects the ambient particle outside the respirator and work out a ratio in effect in a, in a way of giving a fit factor. So, and for you to uh, indicate that you have passed uh, respirator fit testing, you need to achieve hundreds and above. So this is the setup. You see that it's a combination of a laptop where you have your, your software, you have the equipment which is really running the process and the person will be wearing uh, a respirator while this process is being taking place. And in this process, people will be simulating workplace motions where they do about eight exercises which are likely to happen in a workplace. The idea is to stress the respirator to ensure that will it really reset itself 
while you're working or while you're performing your normal work activities. So these are some of the examples that you can, uh, you can choose from uh, between qualitative and quantitative. So it should be noted that besides selecting a good respirator, there are factors which can affect a proper fit. Then if you see the picture below, if you have beards or facial hair, so the respirator, even if it's your correct size and style that fits your facial future, is not gonna fit you. If you have facial deformities, sometimes it happens that along the still area where the respirator needs to sit, you have an injury or something that may cause uh, the respirator not to seal properly. That can also influence uh, the, the feet negatively. As I have mentioned previously, improper donning of respirator is, is quite critical. We see even um, in many workplaces that people, they even opposing the straps where they should put them, or maybe they, 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 they switch around where the respirator need to be fitted. So it's very critical that employees or users need to be trained on proper donning and wearing so that they are able to use this respirator effectively. The poor design of a uh, uh, respirator, sometimes we do get those and they are too big or too small or it, that is not really in line with facial features of many people who are supposed to use these respirators. As we are aware that some of the respirators are designed based on using some panels which have been um, designed using facial uh, features for uh, a specific population. So if maybe the respirator is made using a unique population, sometimes it may look like it's a poor design. However, it doesn't match with the population that is expected to use those kinds of respirator. Incorrect respirator size is very critical. I think even today there are still people who are not aware that even with in, um, for N95, you can get small or uh, and, and medium size respirator. So if you have a smaller size, you are likely smaller size face, you're likely to get a good fit with a small size respirator. So where there are different sizes, I think people need to take advantage of that and uh, provide people with different sizes and they get fitted. That way it will increase the likelihood of getting a fit. So I would like to conclude, as I have said, that is very short, that if fit testing is not done, it means that the respirator user match is not checked to avoid poor fit. So that way it means that people will still not be protected even if they are wearing a correct respirator which is selected for the hazard or a purpose. So if you do fit testing, it means that a proper fitting respirator will be used by a wearer or a user, and that way it will reduce likely exposure um, in respirator users and ultimately minimize the potential for infection. So these are some of the material that has been used to compile this short presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Jindet Banganyi, the head of our occupational hygiene section here at the National Institute for Occupational Health. And we have run out of time for the session, but I am very pleased to note that we probably reached the, the maximum number of, um, what do you call it, uh, attendees for any session that we've ever had. And I would risk to say that we've probably answered the maximum number of questions possible. Is that uh, 319, Sabiwe? Yeah. Yes. Just checking on the monitor on my side. Yes. I think we've hit quite a number of firsts for our Zoom sessions, and we've almost reached the 40th session since we started in the second week of March of 2020. So at this point in time, I need to just uh, say thank you and I need my laptop for the list of the names of all the panelists who've been working very hard on answering those 300 plus um, questions. But firstly, to start off with uh, 
the NIH leadership, uh, and that's the uh, lead uh, training uh, person for COVID-19, my colleague who just finished, Jeanette, the head of the COVID-19 committee here, the outbreak response team, Dr. Tanusha Singh, the executive director, and that's, uh, prof uh, sorry, Dr. Spo uh, Kalamono, as well as uh, the Vital Consortium colleagues and their admin team that's been doing quite a bit of, of work also in the background to make sure that this Zoom session reaches you and that some of you have a data. If you have questions for the Web South Consortium team, you can uh, please uh, write to them, and that is HWS training at witshealth.co.za. HWS training at witshealth.co.za. Okay, and then for our presenters, that's uh, uh, Gabriel Mizan, or Gabby, uh, for dealing with principal health risk assessment, uh, Dikiledi Matuka, and he's from the occupational hygiene section, Dikiledi is from our immunology and microbiology section, where dealt, Dikiledi dealt with the virus assessment tool for COVID-19. And our guest presenters, that's Martin and Momina, for uh, Martin van der Merwe from Protechnic Adult with the testing of respiratory protective equipment, RPE effectiveness. Momina Oberji Adult with the role of SAPRA and the licensing process for medical devices, including those that are regarded as personal protective equipment or PPE for um, the COVID-19 national campaign that we're all contributing to. And then Jeanette uh, Mangani, who ended off with the importance of respirator fit testing. And then to all of our panelists, I did open that email so that I can get to it easily and quickly. And I, there you go. I need to then, at first, uh, just the panelists who you don't see the presentations on screen is Dr. Numpumalelo Ndaba, um, Dr. Tanisha Singh, I think it's Dr. Anna Furi, and the Pume uh, Numpumalelo is from our occupational medicine section. Uh, Dr. Singh, as you've seen at the beginning of this webinar, is in charge of immunology and microbiology. Anna Furi is her colleague as well. Uh, Kateko Makulbele is that hygiene, uh, Jeanette, as well as Karen Dupree from hygiene, Moses Mokene from hygiene, and Ibrahim Oilimi uh, is also from hygiene. And then David Rangogo is also from Occupational Hygiene. I need to say, I hope I haven't left out anybody. Um, and then clearly Glenn and Tabani in IT, so we were here from the Information Services section, handling all of our questions and so on. I need to say thank you very much from myself, Ashraf Raycliff, the National Occupational Safety Training Manager at the NIH. I say thank you for your patience and staying a little bit beyond the normal closure time of half past 12. And we trust that you've received uh, quite a lot of information. I can see some of the thank yous and informative and helpful comments popping up at the bottom of my screen. At this point, I say thank you. We will see you next week for our next sessions. And we say goodbye. For our panelists, we're going to ask you just to hold on, um, just to make sure we clean up the last of the list there. Thank you.